Well, there's a fascinating line from Jesus. If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. I'm going to talk about that and what this means to us today in this part three of our Seeing Clearly series, inspired by Brock Zekeri's teaching, by looking at and exploring the statement by Jesus to the Pharisees. Hello, my name is Drew and welcome to Turning Point Church Online. What Jesus seems to be saying here is holding out a promise that if you are genuinely blind but seeking to find and follow Jesus, but humbly admitting your blindness, then you would not be guilty of sin. Previously, we have been discussing this account of Jesus from John chapter 9, where Jesus heals a man who has been blind from birth. And it turns into a right fiasco when the religious leaders get involved with a somewhat callous investigation into the affair. Now, because the man who was refused entry to the temple because of his blindness has now been healed and can now clearly see, or as it can now see clearly, he's seen as a threat to the system and they kick him out of the temple again. You just can't win with some people. Today we'll pick up the story from that point on. Last week we talked about religious Christianity and how it emphasises certain areas of scripture but glosses over others. It emphasises scriptures that point to the bad in our hearts but this is only partly true while de-emphasising scriptures that point to the good in our hearts, for we are made in God's image and God's law is written on our heart. And it functionally ignores the biblical teaching that the human heart is renewed and made new through Christ. It's worth reminding ourselves of Ezekiel 36, where God talks about the new covenant. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. A new heart, a new spirit, God's spirit. And in Jeremiah 31, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Now to dismiss what our heart tells us when we read scripture is to miss the full counsel of scripture. And of course, neither should we not listen to scripture and instead only listen to our hearts. This means that when we listen to scripture, we should also be training ourselves to say, what is the Spirit saying to me? And when we don't, we wind up, up, end up where the Pharisees are in John chapter 9, where we're completely detached from our heart, might be saying, and it's just our reasoning and intellect trying to figure everything out. We could end up outsourcing our conscience at any given moment, and that can lead to great deception. And that explains why these religious people are less than empathic and compassionate because they are not listening to God's law written on their hearts and speaking to their consciences in certain situations. It is so important that we study and learn scripture, especially to learn what Jesus is saying to us. And of course, the most important part of any Bible study is when we close the Bible, walk away and apply it to our lives what it is we've just learned. Are we now going to carry that with us in our hearts and to not outsource our conscience to a book, to saturate ourselves in the teachings in our Bible that will then refresh our conscience and then we learn to listen to our hearts? When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? So today we're going to begin where we left off last week with the blind man who has just been healed by Jesus but has now been thrown out of the synagogue. Now, if you have been thrown out of or felt compelled to leave a religious institution, something very sad has happened. And I know that I and others listening will have personal experience of this and of how difficult and wretched this can be. But if you've been thrown out of a religious institution into the arms of Jesus, then yes, something sad has happened, but also something wonderful and that is exactly what has just happened to this man. So Jesus found out what had happened and went and found the man. At the beginning of the chapter, Jesus notices the man outside the temple. He was sitting outside the temple because he had been rejected from the religious system because of his blindness. At the beginning of the chapter, Jesus notices rejected and hurting people. And now Jesus not only notices but seeks out and finds rejected people who are outside of the religious system. 
So then Jesus asks the man, do you believe in the Son of Man? Jesus doesn't beat around the bush. He immediately brings a man's attention to himself. What he doesn't ask the man is, do you believe in God? Do you believe in the Holy Bible? Or do you believe in a particular religious institution? Or do you believe in faith? Which is a good question, for many call themselves people of faith, which we can all appreciate. But people of every and any religious persuasion can say that. However, as Christians, we should go a step further, for we are followers of Jesus, and Jesus is the centre of everything. We are people of Jesus. And the man answers, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. And Jesus says, You have seen him, and he is speaking to you. And the man replies, Yes, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped Jesus. This man gained not only physical sight, but also spiritual sight, as he recognised Jesus first as a prophet and then as his Lord. When we turn to Christ, we begin to see him differently. The longer we walk with him, the better we will understand who he is. Peter in 2 Peter tells us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And for this man, Jesus has become his centrepiece, the focus of his intellect his will and his affection. This has been a beautiful story for this man. Then Jesus speaks to the man one more time. I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. On the one hand here, Jesus is giving hope to those who are outcast, and on the other, pronounces judgment on the religious establishment. The group of Pharisees who have been tugging along and eavesdropping on Jesus hear this. Interestingly, Jesus has found the blind man and the Pharisees have found Jesus. And the Pharisees ask Jesus, are you saying we are blind? And Jesus gives it to them quite plainly. If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. But you remain guilty because you claim you can see. The second half of that response is a judgment on religion. A judgment on these people and the religious system a system they have all sealed up, airtight, and they are sticking with it, a system with no openness to anything new, so much so that the wind of the Spirit cannot get in. And this is a great warning to us when we think we have it all put together, all efficiently planned out and organised, but close to the potential of a new way of thinking, with no room for a humble space where we can be ready to receive a new understanding from God, a new revelation. When we have it all airtight, we're in a dangerous position, for God is always bigger than whoever you think he is, because there is always more to learn about God. He always has more surprises for us. Always. And the lesson for Christianity is that we seem to have reached different points in our history where we created a statement of faith and froze everything at that point and then never moved forward. Saying this is it, this works and all our belief and understanding should fit this mould. And anything which disagrees with this creed must then be wrong. We will have created a closed system where we are not open to any newness of the Spirit. And then we are in the same dangerous position as the Pharisees here. Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. However, Jesus has planted a seed here. Sure, condemnation of the religious system is something that is foremost in this chapter. But first he is also holding out hope for everybody else. Jesus says it is possible that there are blind and hurting people. People who are genuinely blind, they know it and they are calling out for more. But just now they can't see it and Jesus is not holding their sin against them. He is praying from the cross, Father forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. There are people who are blind, who are under the grace of God, and there are people who think they see it all, but they are actually spiritually blind. Now, in line with John chapter 9, I want us to look at Hebrews and the last few lines of chapter 5 and the first few of chapter 6. The writer of Hebrews is writing to a Christian church that had not matured the way he had hoped. We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. They have got stuck 
and no longer even try to understand. They hear but do not listen. They have become passive listeners, just going through the motions, not actively listening to what is being taught and to learn as they used to. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. The author points out that it is by now you should be teachers. The goal of Christianity, of Christian maturity, is to lead others to maturity. And the goal of a disciple should be to make other disciples. Therefore go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, as Jesus commands us in the Great Commission. The author asks, how long has it been? Months? Years? Always delaying that responsibility, claiming you need more time to study, you don't feel qualified or have sufficient understanding, or scripture, and that has led to them becoming passive listeners. By now, you should be teachers, yet you still need someone to teach you the elementary truths, the basic building blocks of Christianity all over again. You should be teachers, and yet you are no further than infant school. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. And then he describes them as being like babies, having never grown beyond the baby bottle, being fed milk as they're not yet ready for solid food. The author is reproaching them for they should have grown more than this. They should be teachers and yet they're still only babies, with no awareness of righteousness, living right and making right decisions. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Solid food is used as a metaphor to describe the deeper knowledge of God and our capacity to feast on this deeper knowledge is determined by our spiritual growth. In order to grow from infant Christians to mature Christians, we must learn discernment. We must train our conscience our senses, our mind and our body to distinguish good from evil, to make good decisions in life. The author urges us to physically train ourselves, our hearts and our souls, to make good decisions in life. The word trained used in the passage in the original Greek is the word gymnasio, from which we get the word gymnasium. And having enjoyed the best part of the last 50 odd years in training, physically exercising almost every day for either a competition, my ongoing career or some exploit or other, I can testify to the old adage, no pain, no gain. Effective training requires hard work and commitment in pursuit of the goal. And I'm fairly sure that's what the author is suggesting here, a gymnasium for the mind. Often religious people get lost in theological debates and the act of becoming a better person, a moral person, kinder person, a person filled with the fruit of the Spirit becomes secondary. Those religious people who spend their time wrestling through deep acts of theology often consider the act of becoming a kinder, better person simply baby steps that they have long since moved beyond. However, the author says maturity is being a better person, making wiser, more righteous decisions. That's maturity. The author then continues on in chapter 6 of how arguments about theology are in fact the baby steps that can keep us from maturing. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance for acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. The writer says these are genuine things that we should be learning. However, we should be cautious that the pursuit of what we might think is deeper theology is not the thing which is keeping us at an infantile spiritual level. And sometimes within the church, when studying scripture, we say, I want to go deeper than what this passage points out is that what we think is deeper, is actually what is keeping us at the infantile stage. It's a great exercise for our intellect, but it's at the baby stage. What will push you towards maturity is the constant training in making better decisions concerning good from evil, and walking in righteousness, 
and with an emphasis on applying it to our lives. Then we ask ourselves, how do we get better at listening to the Spirit and getting in step with the Spirit? And how do we recognise when we get it wrong? It's possible to read John 9 with a feeling of pride and superiority, seeing the Pharisees so full of logic, reason and religion, and so disconnected from their hearts that they completely missed the Messiah. But that would only close us off from the openness of the Spirit. So how can we avoid going the way of the Pharisees and still be open to the newness of what Jesus is doing all the time? Trained in righteousness and making right decisions as mature Christians. Well, two chapters earlier in John 7, Jesus says this, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from them. Those two things are true. We come to Jesus, he gives us a new heart, a new spirit, and God's spirit. And then rivers of living water begin to flow from within us. We need to train ourselves to listen to what Jesus is saying to us. And then Jesus helps us to hear what the Spirit is saying to us. And this is not an either or situation. We don't stop reading scripture and then just listen to our heart. We must get saturated in scripture, which will train our changed hearts to help us listen and recognise the voice of the Spirit which helps us listen to the Spirit better. And we will make mistakes. We are imperfect creatures and we do things imperfectly, but we can learn from our mistakes, which demonstrates our maturity. Sometimes we may feel like we are not allowed to make mistakes and within religious circles, we don't learn from our mistakes. We just try to deny them, to pretend everything is perfect. And then we miss a wonderful opportunity. What does it mean then to avoid the way of the Pharisees, these Pharisees who use reason, logic and scripture to fully miss the Messiah, who blamed innocent people and made hurtful decisions that separated family and others from their community? To be like this blind man who gains his sight and falls at Jesus' feet and worships and follows him. My prayer for you then as we learn to listen to our heart is to drink from the fountain of Christ and to have those living waters flow from within. To be a people who recognise this is just the beginning, that now the work begins. Immersing in scripture and confronting our mistakes. Training ourselves and our hearts with spiritual cardio and to mature as Christians with new hearts and new spirit and God's spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that as your spirit speaks to us, that we will have years to hear. We welcome the new hearts, new spirit, and your spirit that you have given us. And I pray that we are able always to listen to and be guided by our hearts and your holy word. That we will grow to become mature, true followers of Jesus. A people who drink from the fountain of Christ and from whom his living waters flow. Amen.